I'd like to start by thanking uh, especially Professor Chambala Gamake for inviting me to deliver this speak uh, to ISL community. And it is nice to connect with uh, Sri Lanka even as a remote interaction. Uh, so uh, please disturb me if you want me to while I'm proceeding because I'm not particularly looking at the screen, I think. Uh, so as uh, you may have noticed, I'm uh, coming from a computer science and engineering background and uh, one of my driving factors is impact. So I always enjoy applying my knowledge in computer science and engineering in diverse domains. Now, for example, uh, in health, education, agriculture, and disaster response. Uh, and um, my PhD research, as well as the postdoctoral research uh, that I'm doing uh, currently. Uh, also, some of my past uh, research aligns uh, with my broad research interest in utilizing human centered AI techniques for social good. Uh, so, during this speech, I'm going to cover what human-centered AI is and what the hot topics in the field of SCAI and why we need a human-centered approach to AI instead of the traditional way of applying AI. Uh, so towards the end of this page, I also plan to share a few example projects that I involved in and currently contributing to as well and reflect on the best practices and methods that made those projects reasonably uh, successful. Uh, so, um, as the example projects, you will hear a lot about my PhD research, which focus on detecting patterns of anxiety using multimodal analytics, and I will also share a brief summary uh, from projects contributing to uh, teaching electronics, robotics, and programming for children and people with range of uh, disabilities. Also, I share what uh, I share what the collaborative intelligence group that I am currently attached to at CSIRO Australia is starting to do uh, in multiple spaces uh, covering um, agriculture, surveillance, and disaster response. So let's start by looking into what artificial intelligence and how this field has evolved during the past decades. So artificial intelligence can be defined as uh, any technique uh, which enables the machines to mimic human intelligence uh, using logic, uh, if then rules, uh, decision trees, and uh, some of the terms that you are starting to hear more popularly, uh, machine learning. Uh, the underlying hypothesis of AI is uh, human mind can be reproduce, reproduced uh, in a computer. And um, the first uh, AI program initiated in 1950s uh, by Christopher Strache. So we, and this AI program could play checker game uh, at a reasonable speed. And a few decades later, by 1980s, the concept of machine learning emerged. And machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence techniques, uh, which can, which use the statistical methods to enable machines to improve at tasks with experience. So if I use, try to use other words. Uh, so machine learning give you, uh, gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. So lately, a subset of machine learning techniques, namely deep learning techniques, has become popular. So deep learning is composed of algorithms uh, that permit software to train itself to promote tasks by exposing vast amount of data to um, structured called uh, multi-layer neural networks, which are kind of inspired, uh, the structures inspired by human brain. So uh, in this talk, I'm not going to cover machine learning and deep learning by explaining their types and the underlying concepts, uh, but um, at a high level, uh, you can just consider both these techniques do the same thing. For example, if we consider an image classification task, uh, so if the task at hand is, is the image given is a car or not a, not a car. Uh, for machine learning, humans uh, needs to ask the computer to focus on particular set of features in doing such a task. So we call it feature engineering or feature 
extraction. Uh, so the computer trained a program to classify a car using sample data by focusing on those features. Uh, while for deep learning, uh, the features uh, to focus are also extracted by the computer itself, reducing what human has to do. Uh, however, in both these cases, the underlying program trained as a black box, uh, meaning that um, you can see input and output, but uh, it gives no view uh, of the process and work in between. So it is extremely difficult even for machine learning or deep learning experts to understand how the computer arrived at such a decision. So these programs are powerful and can be uh, provide many benefits to the society uh, if they're used uh, properly. Uh, and at the same time, they can suffer from overfitting problems, meaning that uh, they can be biased to the data samples that are used to train those algorithms and can uh, act unexpected ways unless designed carefully. Uh, so now that uh, AI is everywhere, and I'm sure that you are starting to hear AI failures uh, more frequently than it used to be. Uh, so here is one example. So perhaps you heard this news. Uh, so TAI was a Twitter-based chat box uh, deployed by Microsoft. Uh, few, uh, and few hours after the launch, the tabot began to uh, post racist and offensive tweets, uh, causing Microsoft to shut it down. Uh, so while this happened, and uh, later it was uh, found that an army of trolls had attacked the service and um, this uh, TI bot eventually learned and made replies based on its interactions with those trolls. Uh, so the designers had not foreseen this kind of potential negative consequences and it led to this uh, disaster. Uh, so here's another example. So it is, uh, if it is possible to identify patients in need of high risk care management and provide those patients with uh, trained nursing staff and primary care monitoring, it would be useful to prevent serious complica complications, right? So if AI is capable of identifying patient at risk. So such an effort was acted in US using an AI algorithm, but the algorithm was much more likely to recommend uh, white patients for these programs than black patients. Uh, so this bias arises because this algorithm used uh, healthcare spending as uh, uh, healthcare spending the cost as a proxy for determining an individual's healthcare need. However, uh, the people of color are more likely to have lower incomes uh, in these countries, and this implicit bias causes people of color to receive low quality care. So it is uh, frustrating. Another such bias um, can be related to uh, this AI program, which was designed to recognize suspects for crimes. And there were many instances reported that the false facial uh, recognition, recognition match sent innocent black men to jail. So this applies to many facial recognition systems, even if you might have uh, experience in online identification verification tools, I have experienced that and the cost me delays and uh, the results show that 10 to 100 times they are more likely to misidentify a black or East Asian face than a, a white face. And when this happens, it's frustrating. And underlying reason for this kind of failures can be related to the data sets used in training these algorithms. Um, they are primarily from uh, lighter skinned people and perhaps uh, also the landmarks uh, in the facial action units uh, uh, selected from this data might not be always suitable across diverse communities. So um, <clears throat> adding into more examples, so here's one more example on biases. A top tech company created a, a computer program to review uh, job applicants Resumes with the aim of mechanitizing the search for top talents. Interestingly, it selected more men. Uh, and this happened partially again because of the algorithm was trained on a biased data set. 
uh, adding into the list self-driving cars were involved in nearly 400 crashes and which left five people dead. But these statistics might not be complete. So how many of you uh, enjoy the creative opportunities of uh, opportunities provided by text to image AI or deep fake? Um, so I have played uh, with them. Uh, so we expect that these, uh, that these trends will more fr frequently use, uh, more frequently see misuses of these technologies in near future and we all are going to suffer from it. For example, can you imagine how quickly misinformation spreads uh, online with these kind of technologies and how it will affect mental health of society as a whole? So um, while I can keep giving you more and more examples of AI failures, uh, so let's keep these uh, few examples in mind and try to understand uh, what are the issues with those approaches of applying AI. So based on my experience and also based on experts view in this field, I've identified uh, four key issues to share with you today. Uh, so first, uh, we might be wrong with the underlying hypothesis for designing AI. Uh, our ultimate uh, effort is to make computer programs that can solve problems and achieve goals in the world similar to humans, but uh, it's not a uh, human and is it correct uh, to say uh, human and machines are uh, similar, so aren't they too different? Uh, also, the effort is uh, to automate everything uh, without thoroughly understanding which components needs to be automated. Uh, this requires uh, proper analysis of end user requirements, uh, where they want AI support and where they don't want AI support. And moreover, when designing AI, it is very rare for us to invest time in forcing the ways that these AI we design can be misused or cause harm. So uh, we need a better way to approach AI and an approach which focus on augmenting human capabilities rather than harming them, even in very rare instances with unexpectedly, and uh, approach which can benefit properly from uh, complementary skills of both human and machines without replacing the humans' jobs by robots or AI agents. Such an approach should only design AI when those AI components add a unique value instead of tendency to automate everything. And such an approach should only design AI when they are truly required by end users. Also, such an approach should also need to spend much time on forcing negative consequences and planning to avoid them in advance uh, as much as possible. Uh, so uh, across the world, so now researchers, policymakers, industry have agreed that we need to put human at the center of AI. So with the rise of industry 5.0, as well. So this imaging approach is called human-centered AI. Uh, here are a few definitions of human-centered AI that I extracted from literature, and all of them highlight in, in a way some of these qualities that I discussed earlier, like amplify and augment human rather than mimicking their capabilities. Uh, another popular definition that I have not included here is uh, involving human throughout the design development and refined cycles of AI. So right, rather than taking, an, uh, taking a data set and come up with an algorithm, just pass the data through and uh, reporting the results and uh, putting a stop over there. So involving human through whole life cycle of AI. So um, some emerging subfields uh, within HC AI field include collaborative AI, responsive, ethical, or trustworthy AI, and explainable AI. So what is uh, meant by collaborative AI? Uh, so collaborative AI is kind of uh, designing AI or other machines like 
robots in a way that human and machines work together toward a shared task as team members, uh, optimizing the use of their complementary skills. So in order to collaborate effectively, human and machine team members needs to maintain a good understanding about uh, each other's states, actions and intents. And uh, I'll let us uh, share some research that I'm currently doing uh, uh, to study situational awareness aspects in human robot collaborative context. So in the subfield of uh, responsible, ethical, and trustworthy AI, researchers from multiple disciplines are actively involved in deriving frameworks and guidelines on how to design responsible AI. Uh, so Australian government lists uh, eight principles uh, contributing to this area. So suggesting that, for example, AI needs to support human values, uh, sus uh, respect privacy rights, uh, should operate reliably and safely and needs to be fair, not biased, transparent. So this, um, all these qualities generally make sense. Like it reflects uh, our values in human, right? Uh, and uh, it, it's uh, very normal to think like why it is very hard to implement. But uh, in reality, um, it is not an easy task to fulfill all these qualities and a lot of uh, research underway to identify how to do that and expand. Um, and you can also refer to uh, the Microsoft's guidelines around trusted AI. Uh, so expanding on the quality of transparent that I just mentioned, uh, there are another emerging subfield, namely explainable AI. So as I mentioned earlier, with uh, most AI-based tools, we don't know how they do what they do. For example, uh, if I take maybe a bird classification task, uh, so we know that inputs uh, are going to be the photos of birds maybe, uh, and uh, we also know the answer or the output of the, it produce, uh, for example, labeling a picture of a parrot as a parrot. But uh, thanks to the uh, AI black box problem, we have no idea how the tools underline turn the input into output. So this seems okay uh, until it produces uh, some unexpected, incorrect, or problematic answers. But uh, when the when results are conflicting with humans' expectations, human needs explanations to understand whether the AI is wrong or the understanding is wrong, and Explainable AI involves attempts to provide users with rationale uh, behind why a certain output was produced and how certain they are, and uh, likewise information, for example, uh, how they will be behave in the future, and that uh, kind of predictions. And now that uh, kind of um, now that I've shared you with the basic understand uh, basic knowledge about why we need. Uh, human-centered AI and what is its AI and what are the emerging hot topics. Uh, so next, uh, I would like to share a few projects uh, that I tend to relate to its AI field. So idea is uh, not to take you through all the technical details or uh, of these projects, uh, but to go through them using a reflective lens and give you an idea about uh, different ways that it's the AI research can be conducted. Uh, so these are a subset of uh, topics that it's AI, uh, the whole spectrum of it's AI projects looks like. So uh, because um, I'm a computer scientist and engineer, so I'm working from a different perspective, but uh, you can refer to uh, the whole area of literature to find like what are the social scientists in this uh, field works, um, like versa. So without further ado, I'll take you through one of these uh, projects. The first pro example that I'd like to take is uh, my PhD project, which was supervised by a multidisciplinary supervisory team uh, coming from uh, data science, uh, inclusive technologies and psychology um, and AI. So I started my PhD five years back uh, with a high level problem in mind. That is, can we use AI capabilities uh, to design clinically meaningful and 
temporarily adaptive digital assistive tools to support improving the effectiveness in anxiety assessments and treatments. Uh, so my overall motivation was to support uh, the issues with anxiety in the society as a whole, uh, which was a big motivation. So as all of us might have experienced at some point, uh, so anxiety is um, can be defined as the irrational anticipation of future threats. And it occurs due to an individual's dysfunctional cognitive thoughts. And for example, if I'm experiencing social anxiety right now, so my beliefs such as I'm uh, incompetent in public speaking should be activated at this moment. And my anxiety experiences should be reflected in cognitive, behavioral, and physiological symptoms. And some of uh, our anxiety reactions are normal, but uh, to date, uh, many people suffer from anxiety disorders. And anxiety disorders impair people's everyday functioning, and these disorders are highly prevalent. Um, and while the demand for precise assessments and treatments is high, the current treatments are usually delayed and also, there's a high uh, treatment gap so with the demands with this pandemic uh, and uh, due to individuals' failures to approach clinicians on time, as well as uh, less accurate assessments that are subjective and intermittent in nature. Uh, so to support this area, the assistive technologies like uh, digital diaries and digital interventions are, have been developed, and current digital diaries provide the space for users to record uh, anxious events outside the therapy and clinicians use these entries in assessment and treatments. And digital interventions have exercises related to treatment components used for anxiety. Uh, so individuals can use them outside the therapy to regulate the anxiety. However, um, current digital assistive technologies have uh, limitations. Uh, so one major limitation is uh, their lack of ability to precisely detect anxiety experiences in real time. So due to this limitation uh, in digital diaries, users need to decide which interventions to record. And uh, in digital interventions, the users need to decide when to use which interventions. And this unavailability of meaningful adaptations affect the assessment outcome and regulation outcomes. Uh, so. To address this limitation, we identified that uh, objective anxiety assessment research uh, that uses human physiological behavioral measures to estimate anxiety can be useful. Although uh, my expertise area is uh, computer science and engineering, I started to review uh, psychology literature uh, and worked with uh, psychology experts to identify how, how anxiety experiences can be defined in terms of a collection of characteristics in this area. And uh, uh, eventually we found that there was no knowledge on anxiety patterns that we can use to implement uh, meaningful adaptations uh, within uh, mobile assistive technologies. Uh, However, considering, uh, yeah, so considering this uh, research gap, so eventually uh, we formulated our research questions around that. So for example, can we, um, can regular and generic phases of anxiety first identified uh, and captured, then objectively assessed in a way that the detection and prediction of these phases can support clinical de decisions and inform the future design of uh, mobile assistive technologies too assist anxiety. So uh, then I started this uh, research by conducting a do domain exploration by conducting 15 interviews with uh, anxiety specialist clinicians. Again, this, is, this was a very new experience for me. Uh, so I had some experience with like conducting user studies with technologies, but uh, 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 early I haven't uh, done purely qualitative uh, um, studies. So as a, uh, however, uh, it was a nice experience and as a major finding of this interview study, uh, we could formulate a computational uh, conceptual framework for re regular and generic phases of anxiety. So in summary, um, the derived framework indicate uh, individuals are likely to go through 
four phases of anxiety. First, uh, when anticipating about interactions with uh, triggers. Second, during the exposure to an, any trigger, which may reflect through four types of reactions. Third, due to rumination. Thus, uh, once the reaction is settled, uh, they would reach a non-anxious phase. So although simple, these phases uh, were not uh, established in literature. So we had to go through uh, uh, understanding, like running studies to understand what are useful phases to detect. And the clinicians could also relate uh, certain interventions uh, that are going to be support regulate anxiety if used within these phases. Uh, and clinicians foresaw several benefits of being able to detect these phases objectively. For example, they suggested implementation of in the moment uh, digital interventions is possible to support patients to break uh, vicious cycles of anxiety. And uh, so to evaluate these phases uh, using uh, multimodal estimators of anxiety phases, uh, we decided, so earlier I said, like we wanted to objectively detect these phases by using physiological and behavioral measures. So we designed a study and established a data set, uh, including 95 young adults. Uh, about half of our participants were patients with anxiety issues, and others were healthy subjects. And the study was guided by a computer system and provided audiovisual instructions. And the study started with two baseline intervals. Uh, then the participant completed uh, two countervalent tasks. Each task provided um, four intervals to calm down, prepare exposure to a trigger, and a recoil from a trigger. So whether where we uh, designed it in a way, uh, it, these phases are naturally flown, like without instructing the participant. And after each uh, task, uh, participants were asked to reflect the experience in speech. Uh, so one task, uh, in one task, uh, participants were asked to prepare and release a bug from a bug box. Uh, when the box was picked up, it uh, started vibrating and giving a natural uh, experience. And once the door was open, a toy cockroach moved uh, a little bit forward, like due to ethical concerns, we could not put in an actual bug bear. And uh, the other task, uh, uh, the asked participant to prepare and deliver an impromptu speech on a difficult topic uh, selected out of three topics in front of a virtual audience. These tasks were designed to in induce bug phobia and social anxiety. And during these tasks, participants uh, had the flexibility to demonstrate uh, different responses. And here's an overview of the variables and other sensors that we use in the study. So we, we decided to record cardiac activity, electrodermal activity, movement, posture, and speech, and uh, based on literature uh, reviews. And uh, sensors were selected not to disturb the natural moments and, and anxiety experiences. And also collected, we also collected uh, video data to, uh, for reference purposes. So overall, we extracted 14 features, trajectories for each unsight experience uh, within five second interval gap. Uh, the extracted features were motivated uh, by the literature and I'm not going to detail how each feature relates to anxiety as well as details on pre-processing data discards and feature calculations because uh, uh, it's not uh, really relevant to the, this topic. Uh, and um, at a high level, uh, the analysis that we use uh, called generalized additive mixed models as statistical method as uh, we selected it because uh, it's a method for modeling nonlinear relationships with uh, flexibility and interpretability. Uh, the two models were derived to compare low and high anxiety group differences as well as uh, the response differences. So both the tasks, uh, we found significant differences in many features between high and low anxiety groups and between responses uh, that we analyze for high anxiety group. And as uh, shown in some of these graphs, uh, some features indicated that uh, two phases occurred and some sensitive features demonstrated two and in rare cases, four phases as well. Uh, so magnitude of many of these features indicated that high anxiety group experience, high anxiety levels uh, aligned to the subjective data that we collected as well. And in both the 
Now, TAS also magnitude indicated that both groups experienced high anxiety level in the bug box TAS uh, compared to the speech TAS, uh, particularly in preparation interval, again, those aligned with the subjective data that we collected. We also uh, found ways to differentiate response types based on feature magnitudes and duration. So in follow-up uh, analysis, um, based on the patterns that we recognize, we operationalize a definition for anxiety phases, considering how the feature fluctuates uh, across phases and how they differ in different high and low anxiety groups. Then we develop a simple rule-based algorithm, uh, which could uh, detect all phases in high anxiety group at a 65% accuracy and detect at, uh, the three phases at a 95% accuracy, which was a uh, uh, very interesting result, like a very good accuracy than we expected as well. Uh, so given the scope of uh, this project uh, was already very large, very large, we concluded our project at that point. And there are a lot of uh, future directions to follow up, uh, as you can see. So uh, you might have wondered why we go for a very uh, non-realistic laboratory. It's not a non-realistic, but uh, compared to the real time, real world situations of anxiety, uh, you can consider it as a non-realistic uh, laboratory-based study. Um, because this uh, concept of phases of anxiety was very novel, so we couldn't go for in the wild studies. Uh, to, uh, if we go for them, so we will collect a lot of noise data so, and wouldn't be able to uh, conclude into uh, good results. Um, uh, so uh, we had to do a foundational research, uh, basically, but uh, it uh, points us that uh, in the future, we need to conduct longitudinal analysis uh, to predict and detect phases in real world scenarios before integrating them into impactful dig digital assistive tools. But uh, we completed the first step of uh, that direction. So now you might... Uh, think like why I took uh, so much time in explaining this project. Um, and uh, so like why I spend that time is to give you a feel of how multidisciplinary and how time consuming some of the AI research uh, projects usually be. So in reflection, uh, this project is uh, built on the motivation to address a compelling societal issue and Unless I took a multidisciplinary approach, meaning limiting the research to computing literature and not conducting qualitative studies with psychologists, we would never find this concept of phases of anxiety, therefore potential impactful future directions. Uh, so you might also have wondered why we did not apply sophisticated machine learning and deep learning methods to this uh, data that we collected. We actually did. Uh, so initially, we used machine learning algorithms to classify phases which demonstrated good accuracies. However, uh, when we uh, go back to the psychology experts, uh, we understood that they won't trust the AI if they can't work out how the AI arrive at decisions. So we wanted to explore more simple and explainable way to detect phases. So we approach uh, at a reasonable algorithm uh, that use a reduced set of feature set, but that can be further improved to be explainable. So although I did not detail earlier, this research also foresee certain ways that this technology can contribute to negative consequences. For example, people with anxiety tend to stigmatize about their symptoms. So if the te technology comes and say that uh, it detected uh, that you are about to experience an anxiety episode, it can make them even more anxious. So given that uh, we have 95% accuracies um, on the negative side, so like 5% can go wrong, right? So it can be the case that uh, it's also a false positive uh, case. So clinicians uh, uh, that we worked with suggested how this technology can present uh, 
uh, using some strategies. For example, uh, the technology can convey uncertainties by saying uh, that in these kind of events, most people feel anxious, but it can be the case that you are involved in a high level of exercise uh, or other possible scenarios and ask the users to decide whether the technology is right or wrong. And in other cases, uh, direct the, uh, if the patients are vulnerable, direct the results to their clinicians for better interpretation without presenting to them directly. Also use the uh, results to encourage uh, the use of uh, assistive technologies. For example, um, uh, the technology can say when you start uh, based on actual statistical data, when you start uh, using this technology, you used to experience 10 panic attacks at a, at a month uh, from, per a month, and now it has reduced to five times a month. So however, uh, I do not define this project as a complete HCI project, which uh, we still have a lot to look into. Uh, so for example, issues like what if um, insurance companies use the data collected in some way to estimate one's mental health and use it to use it against them, for example, like reduce the coverage um, that they provide. And th these complex issues and uh, that requires more research regards to policies, such, uh, the security privacy issues, like how to protect data, uh, vice versa. So next, uh, I'll present a brief, uh, briefly few other projects and I share a few key takeaways as well. Uh, so during my undergraduate studies, I worked uh, with uh, three other fellow students to understand, to come up with uh, a, a modular robot kit to facilitate STEM education. So those days I did not see it as a HCAI project. Uh, so in this project, we created a robot kit uh, that is capable of recognizing the modules that uh, the output robot is built from. Also, uh, accordingly, it presents the users with a graphical user interface, enabling the users to utilize the available capabilities in programming the robot to do a task. So when I see this project from an HCAI perspective uh, uh, later on, so I understood that uh, what we have done is, uh, so using a very low level AI capability to make uh, the robot kit smarter, uh, the created robot to understand, we created the robot to understand what the modules it has and communicate it back to the graphical user interface, but nothing beyond that. And uh, since we only use uh, a simple AI logic, uh, like a kind of uh, uh, very simple logic where it is mostly needed. And this kit enabled a range of creative opportunities for novice services uh, and also the opportunity to program simple logic. So especially in this kind of uh, educational applications, uh, facilitating the learner's autonomy is important. So they are only, AI should only use uh, where it can provide more opportunities rather than like trying to do everything for the user. So another simple example that reflected this uh, finding is uh, through another recent project that I involved in, where I designed and developed an electronics toolkit for people with intellectual and vision impairments. Uh, so this is an example work uh, where we did not know how exactly AI can support uh, in a meaningful way. So due to lack of existing work. So here, uh, I was interested in researching how we can uh, use AI to support people with uh, disabilities to learn electronics. But uh, since the electronics is a novel experience for many people with disabilities, uh, we first designed and developed a simplified electronics toolkit called Tronic Boards Without Intelligent. And we use uh, this non-AI kit to explore the domain. And our aim was to find participants' challenges, which would provide more specific problems to solve with AI. And findings of this study provide us with more specific pro uh, problems. For example, how to use AI to support collaborative troubleshooting. So one thing that they uh, struggled uh, at, uh, but uh, without directly pointing to the issue because that can be seen as a skill development. Eventually during this study, the participant uh, started to struggle to with us 
by seeking support. So in reflection, the lessons we learned from this study is we should not always approach it's AI research with AI design in mind uh, in these kind of cases. And the domain exploration you do with non-AI tools can surprisingly point you to direction where AI can be useful that you have never have a, uh, expected. So uh, that brings me to the last project that I wanted to discuss. Um, uh, so currently I'm actively involved in a project within Collaborative Intelligence Research Program of CSIRO Australia. So, but uh, this overall uh, uh, Sintel, we call Collaborative Intelligence as Sintel. So, but this overall research program does uh, as, uh, having number of projects inside that is there. Uh, so uh, the main theme is to create science to help people and machines to be better together. So it studies how human trust in machines can be improved, how human and machine workloads can be reimagined, how to assist situational awareness requirements in human and machines, and which human and machine skills to use better machine collaboration as underpinning foundation science. Some of the other projects also involved in collaborative monitoring, uh, meaning how AI can be supported by a human can be supported by AI to monitor a situation, for example, in uh, surveillance. Um, there are 24 seven uh, monitoring jobs, like how to reduce their workload and, uh, and in collaborative discovery, how to help human by AI to discover new knowledge. So some of us are working with uh, uh, national collections uh, in Canberra to um, how to digitalize and curate uh, some of the data that has been already collected. So my role is uh, within this program is to support uh, uh, machines like uh, robots to better understand human state action and intents. Uh, so to under so the underlying system and robots can be better adapted to human by changing interfaces between uh, them in a meaningful way. For example, at my site, we have applications where we can send a fleet of robots to a search and rescue missions or smart farm uh, environments to fully automatically explore the map and investigate signs of interested objects. For example, cash casualties, signs of casualties and fruits to pick, um, and while the robots do these tasks automatically, the human supervisor can provide high-level commands to them based on their contextual knowledge and reasoning uh, skills uh, to the uh, user interface. So while the human has the reasonably good knowledge about the robot at the moment, uh, the robot's understanding about human state is still poor. So we still have to under, uh, have opportunities to improve the collaboration between human and robots. Um, although this particular application became uh, the second, got second place in very popular DARPA challenge, uh, which is an international competition. Uh, so recently I have been conducting several interview studies with uh, the users of these applications and also external uh, people who have experienced collaborative robots in surgical applications, mining application, manufacturing applications to understand the situational awareness requirements in human robot teams. So in parallel, I'm also conducting experiments to explore what to what extent the user's physiological and behavioral measures like eye gaze, facial expression, skin conductance, ECG reflect the situational awareness requirements. So in the next few years, we will develop AI to better understand human situational awareness requirements and interface adaptations to support this area. And that's uh, uh, without being so like, actually it is still early to reflect on the methods that we use in this project, but I'll be able to share them with you in the years to come. Uh, so overall, I believe uh, in summary, uh, you get at least uh, some level of understanding um, if, I, if I was successful, why we need uh, human-centered AI and uh, what is it and 
how it can be approached uh, through the lessons that I shared. But uh, remember the lessons I shared is only a subset of experiences that I have in this uh, whole uh, broad uh, area. So uh, thanks, thanks a lot. And um, so I think we have a few minutes for the questions. So I'll stop sharing here. Any, thank you, Dr. Hajini. Uh, any questions or you can post? Uh, Dr. Hajini, uh, thank you very much uh, for the post your interesting question in the chat box if you're unable to speak. So you can yeah. unmute. Yeah, for yes, the interesting sir. presentation. Uh, so I just have a question. Um, so uh, is there any relation between the accuracy of results you obtain and the age of persons from which you collect sensor data for anxiety research? Like uh, yeah, Actually, so that is a nice question. Uh, so that's, that is why we limited our populations to young adults. So actually, if you look into the literature coming from ECG, so basically the heart rate, heart rate variability have like variability across the age, and it is not uh, useful to uh, compare them. So like we predominantly limited our participant uh, population to a certain area, but at the same time, I didn't mention uh, those uh, details a lot. So our algorithm was developed in a way so we can uh, make the algorithm individually specific rather than being generalizable. So uh, what I mean by that is like, uh, we took some baselines before the uh, experiments uh, and uh, all the, so, uh, the uh, analysis proceeded after that is kind of like derived, the features that we derived was uh, compared to those baselines, but not considering them as an absolute value, if that makes sense. Okay, so yeah. We, yeah. Thank we you very much, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I, I think uh, going forward with this uh, application, like where you have, um, uh, robo assisted uh, work with the uh, driving or operating machinery, uh, the level of anxiety of the human uh, partners, uh, it needs to be monitored and uh, taken into account. So I think uh, if the models are not taking the age and that kind of factors into uh, consideration, the, the, the results may not be you know, uh, good. Yeah, thank you. And that's right. And then um, I didn't mention uh, like the data set that we develop is like gender balanced and we try to balance the uh, some of the cultural community groups as well, but it's not perfect, but we kind of considered those factors to a certain extent. That's right. Thanks for asking that. I think yeah. we have was a question, question posted. Uh, can I read it? Yeah, so I can read it. Many of people don't know or expect they have anxiety disorders and how AI can help to find this disease by themselves uh, without psychologists help. So yeah, so uh, that is one of the primary motivations as well for this project. So that's why we talk a lot about uh, integrating these uh, uh, mobile Assist uh, mobile assisting technologies uh, to mobile phones uh, in my research, but um, we also foresaw some um, harms that it can bring. So, like if it is not uh, directly, I talk a little bit about how the results can be presented to the user. Uh, so, yes, that's a, I think. Uh, open research question, uh, but uh, if you look into one of our journal papers, uh, which has been um, published in ACM Health recently, uh, so I kind of touch upon this uh, topic, yeah. So I don't have a direct answer for that, sorry, uh, but uh, it's not the direct solution of deploying these mobile technologies as well. So unless the negative consequences can be minimized. 
Thank you. So any any other question, please? We are going to wind up in a while. Any other questions, please? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> can yeah. I? Yeah, uh, yeah so uh, uh, different uh, populations, if you like, you know, the populations in the sense. Uh, Doctor, you are not clear, sir. So we cannot listen to you. No, no. Uh, in Doctor Devasundara, we can't hear you properly. If you can um, type that into the chat, I can read it and get back to the question. I'll turn off my video as well in case. Yeah, uh, yes. Uh... I think he got disconnected. Uh, Shaman, I think he got disconnected. Maybe we yes, need to wind sir. up. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. So, very good evening to everyone. Uh, it is with uh, great pleasure that I'm uh, delivering the vote of thanks. Firstly, on behalf of IT and Computer Engineering Session Committee, we wish to express our sincere gratitude to IESL President, Secretary, and the staff. So, our special thanks to Dr. Hashini Senaratna, who has given her precious time to conduct this event from Australia. And we are thankful for sharing her immense knowledge on human-centric artificial intelligence technologies with our engineering community. Once again, many thanks to enable this evening to have a successful event. Also, I would like to thank our organization team of IT and Computer Engineering Section Committee for helping us to arrange this public lecture. So thank you. Thank you so much. Have a pleasant day. Thank you, Dr. Hajini. Thank, thank, thank you, you very Hashini. much for that. I really appreciate I, I enjoyed the conversations. Thank Thanks. Thank you. Thank you all. Good night.